Welcome back to the VTU e Shikshana program of uh, 18 ARC 43 Building Services 1. Today we are going to uh, conclude on the sewerage system which is basically about the disposal of sewerage, the units of sewage treatment and the methods of disposal. Now we are also going to see uh, various aspects of ventilation of sewage treatment plan along with its disposal. As we all know sewage starts putrefying that is the process of decaying or rotting in a body of other or other organic matter after every 4 to 5 hours of its development. If the sewage is not disposed of within this 4 to 5 hours then the treatment required to be given to the sewage will become more exhaustive. So, you have to be very sure about conveyance of sewage. So, the next step that uh, comes to our mind is the disposal. So, sewage should be disposed of without treatment or after treatment right at the source immediately and sewage should be disposed of either in the natural water courses or onto the land. There are various methods of sewage disposal, some are natural and some are artificial. For natural methods we use the dilution that is the dilution method or the land treatment method. For artificial methods we have the primary treatment or even the secondary treatment. In natural methods the first thing that we are going to see is the disposal by dilution. Raw sewage or partially treated sewage is thrown directly into the natural waters and this sewage is gradually purified by self purification capacity of the natural water. So, this is called as disposal by dilution because as it dilutes as the time proceeds it self purifies itself as it you know um, moves through the course of water. The organic matter gets oxidized by dissolving the all the oxygen in the water and which results in simple inoffensive substances. Oxygen which is used up for this and replenished from the atmosphere and the rate depends on the rate of re-aeration, the type of organic matter and the velocity of the flow. Self purification basically happens in four stages, one is called as the degradation zone where the point of entry of sewage is seen. Here the water is turbid with darker color. Once it starts decomposing the water turns grayish, there is objectionable odor of H2S, scum might be seen on the surface. Third there is a recovery zone where the organic matter is reduced and the oxygen content starts increasing, the bacteria load also increases. And the fourth is where the clear water zone is. So, this is after it is purified, the steam attains its normal conditions and we almost see the normal kind of a water there after the aeration uh, happens. In dilution basically organic matter is diluted by a large volume of water and in oxidation it is oxidized by dissolving all the oxygen and it continues till it is completely oxidized. Whereas, in reduction the organic matter is reduced to liquids and gases by action of bacteria. In sedimentation all the settleable solids which drop down to the bottom give more time and chance for oxidation as well as reduction. While self purification also happens through sunlight, here the all the oxidation happens through aeration and a bleaching effect. This disposal by dilution is not suitable for heavy industrial waste. It totally depends on the type of natural water body that we are letting out the waste to, the re-aeration of the capacity, the velocity of the flow and the locations of sewage entry. Other uses of that natural water body should also be considered before we let out all the water into that water course. Disposal by dilution requires a lot of time for the natural process, so it is suitable for only small amounts of sewages only. Disposable by land treatment, the second disposal, the raw sewage here is partly, uh, is partly treated and applied over the land. A portion evaporates and the remaining percolates through the ground. It adds as a fertilization value to the land and requires expert monitoring to ensure that hygienic conditions prevail upon the land. During the land treatment of disposal, sandy or alluvial soils are easily aerated, 
the depth of water table should be very low and the low rainfall should be very good with respect to its absorption capacity. Absence of river or other natural water bodies in the vicinity should be one prominent feature of disposal of land treatment and the la uh, land upon which this is going to be treated should be a large open area and this should be available as a large area for a very long period of time. There are a lot of actions which happen on a dilution process where we are letting out all the uh, waste into the lands. One is the biological action, here all the soil bacteria convert the sewage into plant food. Two chemical action where all the uh, organic matter is oxidized. Third is the physical action where filtration happens. This filtration basically facilitates oxidation depending on what kind of soil is present there. This sewage also acts as fertilizer because major portion of the water that we are going to use after this um, land disposal is for irrigation purposes. So, we see there are a lot of chemical substances which are present in the land there now like nitrogen, phosphate and potash. So, they are, can be directly utilized by the plants or the crops which can be grown can be grown there depending on the quality of sewage which is applied as well as looking into the health regulations of that particular crop. The second methods are the artificial methods. Here sewage which contains large amounts of waste products and disease producing bacteria which cannot be directly disposed of either by dilution or land treated are actually let out. If this is done, the receiving water becomes polluted and in case of land treatment, the land also becomes sewage sick. So, it is very essential for us to give some kind of a treatment before the sewage enters into its disposal level. The objective of this kind of a treatment is to reduce the sewage strength and to avoid pollution and the second is to remove any kind of pathogenic bacteria from a sewage system. So, this process basically goes through two different treatments, one is the primary treatment where you are screening all the waste through bars, then sedimentation, then we have our secondary treatment which actually goes through filtration, the activated sludge process, the disposal of sludge and dilution. This also has disinfection here because we are going to dilute all the water again by water as well as through irrigational methods. Sewage treatment as shown in the previous class is actually divided into two different treatments, one is the primary treatment here and the second is the secondary treatment. In a primary treatment, the larger solids are removed the complex compounds are decomposed to simpler compounds. In the secondary treatment, the exhaustively treated and completely purified by filtration or activated sludge processes. Third is the disinfection process where the, disin, uh, where the sewage is disinfected with respect to its effluence if required. The units of operation in terms of this treatment are based on Removal, the first step is removal of coarse suspended and floating matters. This is done through screening. So, there are bar racks which screen it or fine screens or even cutting screens or commutators which you saw in the previous video. Second is removal of grease and oil which is called as flotation or skimming. Here we have separate skimmers or skimming tanks and also a settling tank which would collect all the scum. Third is removal of finely divided suspended matters also called as sedimentation as well as chemical precipitation. So, how does sedimentation happen? Sedimentation first basically happens around the grid chambers and de detritus tanks. Next settling or sedimentation tanks also come in where we have plain sedimentation tanks chemical precipitation tanks and septic tanks. These septic tanks could be single storied or double storied based on their Imhoff capacity. 
Fourth is removal of finely divided suspended matters also called as filtration. Here the land is treated for irrigation purposes. Intermittent sand is also filtered and rapid sand is used by the magnetic filtration and we remove all the finely divided suspended matters. So, if we go back to the stages, I will just go back again. First, we screen the sewage, right? Then we skim or you know remove or uh, remove all the scum from it. Third, we actually uh, remove all the chemicals as well as finely divided suspended materials. Fourth is we remove the finely divided fil uh, methods through filtration. So, after this is done, we stabilize all these putrescible material in suspensions in colloidal states or even solutions through biological treatments. So, this is where biological treatments come in. We treat them through land treatment or irrigation. We have intermittent sand filtration methods where we are using trickling filters or we also have contact aerators, activated sludge processes or even oxidation ponds. Depending on what exactly is convenient for us, we can use the biological treatments here. After which the sludge is treated, the sludge is treated for its digestion, then for centrifugal concentration, for coagulation by heat, chemicals and freezing, by, for elutrization and biological flotation, then we air dry all the sand beds, then dry the heat and then uh, let in through the incinerators. If we go into detail, uh, not in detail, but in brief to all these treatment processes. First thing is primary treatment, which is basically going to use the screens. Screens are used to remove all the floating matters of large sizes like dead animals, tree branches and even any waste like plastic waste and all. The screenings are burnt, disintegrated, incinerated or used as fertilizers. Next grid chambers here all the sand grids are removed and heavy organic matter is also removed along with sand. This grit is used as landfill or even mixed with soil to used as manure for garden crops. A detritus tank removes all the finer particles than those removed by grit chambers. Then we skim all the floating substances like grease, soap, wood pieces, fruit skins, etc. These are usually buried in low lying areas or even burnt. The plain sedimentation tanks or settling tanks remove the large suspended organic solids by settling at the bottom. So, the strength of the sewage is reduced by 30 to 35 percent by the time it enters into the sedimentation tanks. So, this sedimentation tank also called a settling tank separates all the sludges and effluent waste. After it separates, it enters into the chemical sedimentation area where all the dissolved and colloidal form of organic suspended materials are segregated by adding chemicals like alum, salts of iron, etc. Next comes the conversion of organic matter into the stable form and then it is broadly divided into two parts where we enter into the uh, secondary treatment. So, this, during the secondary treatment process, first stage is the filtration where all the effluent sewage basically passes through all the filtering mediums. Here the organic matter which is caught in all the filtering machines or the medias is oxidized. The aerobic bacteria which is decomposing the organic matter also results in removal of all the fine suspended and dissolved organic matters. So, how does this happen? This happens through intermittent sand filters, trickling filters or septic tanks and even the oxidation ponds. All the uh, waste which is removed and filtered again collects itself as sludge at the bottom. So, here activated sludge process is happening at the base bottom by secondary settling tanks. So, all the activated sludge which is collected in presence of abundant oxygen is again let out into the settling tanks. This contains a lot of aerobic bacteria and other micro uh, organism which also have a lot of capacity, maximum capacity to oxidize. So, this unusual capacity to oxidize is mixed with raw or partially treated sewage after the prim primary treatment 
where the microorganisms multiply rapidly and oxidize the organic solids. The basic process of an activated sludge process is the primary clarifier would be the first stage from where it enters into an aeration tank then a secondary clarifier. The secondary clarifier basically lets out all the effluent waste there. From where it enters from the second clarifier it enters into the activated sludge process again if we see a lot of waste we let out into the aeration tank for a cyclic process otherwise we let it out into another tank which is called as a sludge digestion tank from where the sludge is uh, dried as a bed. This activated sludge is mixed with effluent from a primary clarifier. This mixture is agitated and aerated in an aeration tank. After the agitation, the sludge is allowed to settle in this tank and a portion of the sludge is recirculated. The remaining goes to the sludge digestion tank. The sludge digestion tank is basically a tank which would oxidize all the sludge as well as remove or reduce the digestion of sludge. The sludge is collected from primary settling, chemical sedimentation as well as activated sludge process. The next stage is chlorination where we are removing all the disease producing bacteria as well as other organisms from the water body. <coughs> The disposal on land, this is one method by mixing when we are mixing the sewage with lime water and this we are letting out all the waste onto the land. When the sludge dries out, the field is ploughed and crops are raised. Second is when the trenches are dug in fields and are filled with sludges and they are covered with a layer of earth. So, they act as fertilizers or even manure for the crops. Next, we also have the drying beds. The dumping into the sea happens here because sea water is in abundance and sludge can be easily finished by disposing it in it. If they are disposed in the deep sea and it, if the sea water is very uh, far from our shore. And heat drying happens when we are adopting to this method to convert all the sludge from activated sludge process to manure. And this is called as a method of producing fertilizer rather than the method of disposal. Incineration, here the burning sludge is burned at higher temperatures in furnaces. The volume of the sludge is reduced and ash is stabilized. It requires air permit and pollutants are removed by high operating costs in this whole complex process. The lagooning or ponding, this technique is a natural treatment technique that basically considers accumulation of all the wastewater into our ponds or basins. This is also known as biological or stabilization ponds where a series of biological, biochemical and physical processes are taking place. So, in these ponds since they are called as ponds there is a lot of storage of water here. When these waters are stored then we are letting out all the bacteria by to act with the water in a bio, uh, with respect to the time period in biologically and because of the introduction of chemicals and biological uh, and physical processes this whole process takes a lot of time. Next comes chlorination this is the process of applying chlorine to the sewage and to all the affluent waste. Chlorine which acts as a disinfectant is used to apply undesirable growth of algae as well as related organisms in the sewage. It also prevents undesirable growth of iron fixing and slime forming bacteria in the sewer lines. So, when chlorine is added we are very sure that all the bacteria which would produce harmful effluents are removed. This also prevents bonding as well as any kind of slime growth in all our trickling filters. Chlorine helps in control of odor in a sewage treatment plant and also it reduces or delays the BOD of a wastewater. Chlorine destroys hydrogen sulphide which is highly corrosive and protects the concrete from you know paints and other mortar. The next is septic tanks. Septic tanks are also called as Imhoff tanks. 
They are suitable for areas where piped water supply facilities exist, but the public sewerage system has not been installed, like any kind of a new developed uh, township or colony. To deal with any kind of sewage which is developing from such areas, septic tanks and emov tanks are constructed. Septic tanks are constructed for single family or group of families, whereas imhuff tanks are always constructed for many families or groups of families. Imhuff tanks are two storied, upper compartments contain sedimentation of sewage and in lower compartments digestion of sludge takes place. Septic tanks are usually rectangular or circular and they are underground chambers built with brick or stone. They are plastered inside and outside with 1 is to 4 cm cement mortar. Minimum liquid capacity of a septic tank should be at least 1000 liters. Minimum width of a septic tank should be 750 mm and a depth should be 1000 mm. The ventilating pipe of a septic tank should be at least a 50 mm dia and a 2 meter height if more than 20 meters away and 2 meter from top of any building which is at a distance of 20 meters. Septic tanks are watertight single storied underground tanks. So, you understand when they are watertight, when they are underground there would be a lot of foul smell coming in there. Okay, so, in these sewage you have uh, retaining the sewage for a very long time and you also permit sedimentation of the suspended solids and partial digestion of all the settled sludges by anaerobic bacterial action. These tanks are generally rectangular shape, they also have a roof. Septic tanks are usually two chambers which are separated by, e two e by each other by a baffle wall. The first chamber in which the sewage enters is called as a grid chamber or a screen chamber where settleable inorganic matter settle down and the other is called as anaerobic chamber where organic solids settle at the bottom, where anaerobic bacteria acts on it and converts the complex unstable compounds to simple stable compounds. Colloidal and dissolved matters are digested inside the tank and the sludge settles down in the tank and clarified sewage is discharged throughout the outlet. These tanks have to be disledged periodically, so you, from 6 months to 2 years and they are to be delivered into a cesspool or into a suitable vehicle for removal of site. So, you cannot keep collecting all the waste in a sewage uh, on a septic tank for a very long period of time. Every now and then you have to keep entering into it to check as to what exactly is happening in both the chambers right in the anaerobic as well as the aerobic chamber check on to the complex methods and desludge it. So, you know periodically so the suitable vehicle should be brought in to remove all the sludge from there and this can happen from a period of 6 months to 2 years. For a period for a peep, for a septic tank for 10 people we basically have a single compartment septic tank like this with an inlet which is of a 100 uh, diameter pipe and an outlet same diameter and this is the section of the uh, septic tank this would be a ventilating pipe right and that would be the cover a concrete roof or a removable precast concrete slab and this, this is a thick concrete or a cement mortar finish uh, uh, thing and this is where all the sludge gets collected. After every 6 or 10 uh, months you keep desludging it by removing it out, out of the outlet. This is for 50 users, so it is a much larger scale. You have an inlet chamber, you have a baffle wall and then you also have a scum board. Right? So, you would have a baffle wall which is basically going to trap all your grease as well as oil and then only the sludge comes in. The sludge is again uh, settling down and the scum comes and collects it there. So, the scum is let in uh, sorry is collected and only the sewage is let out into the outlet. These are septic tanks, these are um, you know images of septic tanks. So, you have a sewage entering from the house, this is the sludge, that is the scum and the waste water which comes out of your baffle wall is uh, actually drained into the field or even for other 
um, purposes. So, this is another image where we see that the waste water comes out of all the waste and then it directly enters into the manhole and then from there the septic tank is located in a closer proximity before it enters into the uh, ground water. There is a distribution box which has a vent pipe and we also have perforated pipes which are all along the you know fields or gardens or lawns and then we drain these fields whenever needed and then it gets percolated into the soil and the soil actually absorbs all the nutrients and makes the land a much better uh, or a much pervious uh, land. Septic tanks and the effluents which come out of the septic tanks are to be disposed by two, uh, either of the methods. One is dilution. Dilution is basically when you are letting it out into a stream with perineal, peri, perineal flows. Second is by gardening or irrigation like I showed you in the earlier slide. Third is for absorption system where we are basically using it as a soak pit. Soak pit is an effluent which is led into the soak pit and gradually absorbed by the surrounding ground. No underground drain drinking water supply should be situated within a radius of at least 60 meters around a soak pit. A leaching cesspool, this is where the bottom is made watertight to retain all the sludge and the sewage, but the upper portion is provided with open joints through which the effluent disperses into the surrounding soil. The third is through trenches, the dispersion trenches. Also, we can use filters in surface drains where the effluent is first allowed to percolate through a filter, then discharge into a surface drain. So, these are the sizes of septic tanks which are uh, available for residential uh, purposes. For depending on the number of uses, the length, breadth and depth also keeps increasing. So, from 5 uses to 250 uses. Beyond this, it is very difficult for us to maintain a septic tank. So, a much larger cesspools are or Imhoff tanks are actually given here. For hotels, at least until 300 people or for boarding spaces for 300 people and their uses, we provide septic tanks. Where are they located? Location of septic tanks is basically at the highest groundwater level. They are sub, uh, provided in places where water supplies such as boards, creeks, dams, buildings and boundaries are not uh, available or there is a clear distance from it. There are subsoils and open drainage channels and we also have to have a clear distance from them. Weight of a vehicle might damage the system. So, compacting the surrounding soil should also be done so that it reduces the abil ability to absorb all the effluent here. Then we also have stabilization ponds. These ponds are referred by many names such as oxidation ponds, redox ponds, maturation ponds and sewage lagoons. They consist of shallow man-made basins which comprise of single or several series of anaerobic facultative or maturation ponds. These ponds sedimentation oxidation takes place simultaneously and the process of treatment largely depends on interaction of bacteria as well as algae. Here anaerobic bacteria and algae come together and work together for mutual benefits and the, it converts the decomposable organic matter to more stable products. In the process of oxidation, it is divided into three stages. First stage is the fresh sewage when it is, dis, uh, when it is uh, supposed to go into the dissolved oxygen because the ponds are open, there is always a lot of oxygen which is available in the atmosphere. So, this oxygen is utilized by all the anaerobic bacteria in oxidizing the putrescible matter in the sewage. During this, oxygen is consumed and carbon dioxide and nitrates are also formed. The algae utilizes the carbon dioxide in the presence of sunlight and liberates all the oxygen through photosynthesis process. A part of the liberated oxygen by algae can be utilized by an aerobic bacteria for decomposition. The other remaining oxygen content is utilized to create and maintain the anaerobic conditions for the bacteria. So, there are various types of stabilization ponds. 
one is aerobic stabilization ponds these are shallow ponds of about at least 30 centimeter depth which maximize the growth of algae the condition of these aerobic uh, ponds are maintained by the sewage which is stabilized and this is suitable where uh, you need to harvest algae and harvesting of algae is a desirable condition anaerobic stabilization ponds are where anaerobic conditions prevail here the bacteria obtain their required oxygen from the chemical compounds present in the waste and the anaerobic decomposition takes place these ponds are at least 2 0.5 to 3.7 meters deep and the effluent from this contains more biological oxygen demand and needs further treatment. Facultative stabilization ponds are ponds where a depth varies between 90 to 150 centimeter. So, it is a combination of aerobic as well as anaerobic uh, actions. Here during sunlight and anaerobic actions in India most of the stabilization ponds are facultative stabilization ponds because we are going to use a lot of both aerobic as well as anaerobic actions. We use it during the sunlights because we have good summers here and also during the nights when anaerobic actions are supposed to take place for our soil we also use the facultative stabilization ponds. So, if you actually consider this, this is an inlet it's an anaerobic uh, tank and an outlet right when facultative comes in we have percentages of oxygen and the oxygen supply through the surface conduct and it lets out into the surface when it is aerobic the oxygen supply happens through the surface content the water content is lower because oxygen is continuously being supplied all right and we have uh, a mixture of all the three also where anaerobic tanks are separate aerobic tanks are separate and facultative are also happening simultaneously so aerobic is basically well mixed tank um, facultative is where all the sludge gets settled and decomposes anaerobically and residual sludge is where all the settling happens and the effluent comes out out of its outlet. The disposal of industrial waste, industrial waste are uh, waste which results out of all the manufacturing processes from the industries and these wastes could be solids, liquids or even gaseous. Solid waste if stabilized do not create any problem, but the liquid waste are the waste which create a lot of problems. So, industrial waste generally contain a lot of toxic substances and also strong chemicals hence they need to be dealt separately and these industrial wastes differ widely from each industry. So, careful study should be made with respect to their treatment. The various disposal methods, there are two methods of disposing industrial waste, one is to discharge it into the city sewer the system, second is to design and construct a separate plant and treat the industrial waste. In case of strong industrial waste, you might be given pre-treatment by the owners of the industry before admitting it into the municipal sewage system. Now, this sewage system is supposed to be ventilated. Most of the new sewage treatment plants are built in building basement areas. The whole facility is enclosed in a single building. So, a sewage treatment system is a combination of pre-treatment primary treatment, secondary or biological treatment as well as tertiary treatment. So, any sewage treatment plant would have all these processes where the primary treatment happens aerobic, anaerobic as well, the secondary where biological treatment is happening and tertiary after everything is done. So, sewage treatment plants basically produr, produce a lot of odor during the treatment processes. These compounds are generated by biological processes at different stages at different states within the plant. Typical areas of odor emissions are where the inlet pipelines are okay, or at the inlet pump stations with the bar screening, oil and grease traps, biological processes and sludge handling and sludge drainage. There is a wide spectrum of possible inorganic and organic molecules which create a lot of unpleasant odors. So, the most common are ammonia, amines, aldehydes, ketones, 
sulfur compounds, hydrogen sulfide and mercaptans. Especially for any treatment plant that is located near uh, residential or commercial building, these emissions lead to lead to a lot of problems for the residents there. So, regulations are to be kept in mind when reducing the emissions and setting the limit for selected parameters or compounds. When the STPs are built in the basement of the buildings as per the rules of the pollution control boards in India, it is compulsory to provide exhaust from the STP room and it is also mandatory to use the ozone in the exhaust for odor destruction. Ozone is a very strong oxidizer and it reacts quickly with the organic compounds. Since they are majorly organic compounds which are released from the STP, ozone reacts with the organic compounds instantly and oxidizes them. So, once it starts oxidizing itself, then there is lesser foul coming in. Normally for reduction of odorous gas, dilution of the outside air is also one of the major requirement. Due to which the large capacity of fresh air supply uh, duct is supposed to be put up to pollute uh, to dilute the polluted air. Generally 5 to 7 fresh air changes are required for every STP exhaust. The integration of air ozonization system and injection of ozone into the air handling system is the latest and the most popular technology to reduce H2S and NH3 from enclosed STP exhaust. Ozone generator is kept in the STP plant room and connected to the exhaust duct line through ozone injectors. These ozones will be injected at entry points of exhaust air ducts and they will be dosed off at every 1 to 2 per minute of 20 to 25 ACH. The ozone generator is floor or skid mounted with integrated pipes as well as wires. The ozone generator system is designed for continuous operation with an auto on and off mode. The cooling system for this kind of a generator is provided for cooling of the ozone cell. What are the guidelines for designing an STP? Designing of an STP is an important part for a sewage treatment plan because uh, the STP is where we actually are treating all our waste before we let it out into the municipal waste uh, process. A general headroom should be provided of at least 3 meters which should be maintained for enclosed or underground STPs with artificial ventilation. This can be reduced to 2.5 at localized points that is if there are beams and under beams and all you can go for 2.5 meters. For an any enclosed STP a minimum air volume of 14 meter cube should be provided and artificial ventilation should be provided with not less than 10 air changes. So, at least 10 air changes are required per hour. So, ventilation exhaust pipes should be carried up to a height of not less than 1 meter above the roof of the building upon which the STP is located. Access walkways of minimum 0.75 meters of a clear width should be maintained within the STP for access to all areas requiring maintenance and operation. Walkways should also have safety rails, preferably stainless steel and tow boats. These walkways should also be laid at a 1 is to 25 cross fall to prevent any kind of ponding if solid construction and they should not be obstructed by crossing pipe work. So, with this we are done with severage. In the next class we will be looking into storm water and its appurtenances its in, right from its introduction to appurtenances to its disposal. Thank you so much.